your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you only.
cannot fail The only thing I found Is through it all You never let me down You don't hold back Relentless in pursuit At every turn I come face to face with you Like a tidal wave Crashing over me Rushing in to meet me here Your love is fierce Like a hurricane That I can't escape Tearing through the atmosphere Your love is fierce Like a tidal wave Crashing over me Rushing in to meet me here Your love is fierce Like a hurricane that I can't escape Tearing through the atmosphere Your love is fierce Thank you, thank you so much, Pastor, for having us here. It's good to be back. I know we were here many, many years ago, and uh, a lot has changed. Uh, it, you guys look so good. Um, my uh, wife and daughter are here today. Why don't you stand and wave? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> my wife and I are originally from Pakistan. I got saved from a Muslim background in Pakistan. And I'll share with you uh, my story, how I came to know the Lord uh, from a Muslim background. And um, before uh, God called us to mission, I was in sales and marketing in the Chicagoland area for, um, for about 12 years. My last job was a pricing analyst for a large Japanese uh, manufacturer. Um, they made ball bearings. And, and so the Lord um, called us to missions and... Um, and it's interesting because um, before even the Lord called us to missions, um, we went to a church that we didn't learn anything for about 10 years uh, after we came to America. And, uh, and then we, someone told us about this church in um, Naperville, Illinois. And uh, it's a Pentecostal church, Assembly of God church. And we had never been to a Pentecostal church before. And I remember the very first service, we were blown away. And, uh, and um, thank you, Karen. And uh, so we, we loved it. The very first service, we rededicated our lives to the Lord. And uh, we got baptized into Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so we were so excited. We wanted to share this Pentecostal experience with our folks back home, and especially with my uh, wife's uh, family. So we made a personal trip to Pakistan uh, to share uh, them about this new experience, and we, we shared with the whole family, and, and they all accepted Christ in a fresh way. And, and, and so, so our time was up, uh, our vacation time was up, so we had to come back. So we told the missionary in Pakistan at that time, so would you please take care of these families? Would you just disciple them? So he said yes, and so we came back, but um, a year or so later, we heard that that small group wasn't small anymore. It was the first Assembly of God church in the capital city of Pakistan. Can you believe that? And we had no idea. God used us, made us instrumental in planting that church. And the church is doing great in Islamabad, Pakistan. There are way above 500 people there. So we praise the Lord for that. So we came back, and then uh, we just went ahead about our business in America. When we got a letter from the missionary, they're saying that, you know, we are needed in that part of the world, and please consider coming back. So we showed that letter to our pastor, and... and uh, he said, well, let me pray about it. Pastor Bob Schmidtgill used to be the pastor that time. He passed away. And so uh, he, he prayed about it. And then after a few days, he met with us and he confirmed that, yes, that's what the Lord wants us to do. And so, so we just quit our jobs and we went to missions to Pakistan. Uh, the only problem was I knew a whole lot about ball bearings, but I had no idea about missions. We, I, I had no Bible school background, nothing at all. But praise God, the Assembly of God has a category um, uh, under which you can go and work under a missionary. 
and learn from experience. So that's what I did. So we quit our jobs, went to Pakistan, worked for Teen Challenge for two years. And it was during that time, my wife and I, we were seriously injured in a suicide attack at our church in Pakistan. And um, I'll share that story a little bit later. Uh, both my wife were uh, seriously injured. My wife had a multiple tibia fracture. She was uh, in full cast for three months. I had deep shrapnel wounds on my um, foot, and my foot is still partially numb because of nerve damage. So we went through some difficult time. Uh, one grenade exploded just uh, 39 inches from us. Can you believe that? 39 inches. The same grenade killed uh, a girl across the aisle from us and one guy behind us. But somehow the Lord spared our lives. Altogether, five people got killed, including two American nationals, and uh, 50 people got injured. So, um, so after the attack, uh, we stayed there for three months until we were able to walk again. And so we came back to America after that. It took us a couple of years to recuperate. And you would think that we are done with mission, right? We're not going back, but exactly opposite happened. The, the Lord gave us the boldness to go back. So we went back to Pakistan for another three years uh, as special assigned. By that time, I had my licensing done with Assembly of God. And um, I, I started the Fire Bible Project. Fire Bible is the Pentecostal study Bible. It's a great study Bible. So we, uh, I started that project to translate that into Urdu language. Um, and and the, the Fire Bible is now complete. I, I didn't complete it. We had to go to England. But the Fire Bible in Urdu is now complete, and I have a copy of that in my hand. Isn't that great, awesome, that the pastors in Pakistan have a study Bible that they can use to reach the lost over there. And then I taught English as second language to Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Uh, the school was later on shut down because of a serious threat from the Taliban. So we moved to England, and uh, we were there for six years, reaching Muslims, engaging with them on the streets. And, um, and last year, we transferred to Global University in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, so I uh, use online courses uh, in multiple languages to reach the lost and train the found across the world. We are in about 160 countries, and I'll share with you a little bit about what we do at Global. Um, to date, we have over 500,000 students around the world. So that's got to be the largest distance learning Christian university in the world. 500,000 students around the world. And since 2010, over 15,000 churches have been planted and over 4.2 million people have made the decision for Christ. Isn't that awesome? That is so cool. Here are some ongoing um, projects that we're involved in, and th these are just a few of it. Um, we have India College of Ministry, Global University's India College of Ministry, currently has more than 12,000 students enrolled across India. Uh, we have European School of Ministry. 300 Christian service level students are enrolled in the European School of Ministry. Several have planted and are planting churches as they're studying. Then we have Spanish MA. Global University is in the process of translating MA in ministry degree into Spanish language to, sa uh, to serve the Spanish-speaking community in the United States and around the world. Then we have prison ministries. Currently, 3,700 inmates are being served monthly across the United States by Global University. And there are around 1,000 written testimonies of salvation each year year from these prisoners. Isn't that cool? Prisoners are getting saved and they're studying our courses to be the future leaders. Now, what I'm about to share with you is extremely sensitive, and I'm going to be showing a, a short video uh, later on. And, um, and, and so we're going to put a pause during this time. And those of you watching online, I'm sorry you had to be in the church. But, uh, but I cannot show this to you, but it's ex extremely sensitive, and uh, it can jeopardize the ongoing ministry uh, over in that part of the world. 
God is doing amazing things among Muslims. Uh, they were, they're having dreams and vision. Jesus is appearing to them. When we were in England, um, one of the things I did is visited the, um, the prisons and the detention centers where there are a lot of Muslims there. We had chapel service once a, once a month. And, um, and I saw many Muslims got saved through in that chap uh, chapel service. Eight Iranians got saved and water baptized. There was one Muslim uh, man that I befriended with. Um, um, I shared with him the gospel, and um, I continued to visiting him. Um, he became my good friend. One day I told him, you know, uh, you've been praying to Allah all your life. Why don't you pray to Jesus tonight and ask him to uh, reveal himself to you? And he said, okay, I'll do that. So that night, he prayed to Jesus instead of Allah. And that night, he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw that he was surrounded by his family members and friends who were pointing fingers at him. And then he saw a man dressed in a white robe appear. And he took him by his hand, and he said, come, follow me. These people cannot harm you. And so next day he called me and shared with me the dream. And he asked me, brother, do you know what that means? And I said, I, I think so. I, I think so. I know what that means. So I explained to him about the dream. And I told him, you know, that he was blessed that Jesus himself appeared to him. And he wants him to follow him. And so that day he gave his heart to Jesus. And... Uh, and now he's in England. He, he was able to get out of the detention center, and I connected him to a local church. So pray for people like him. There are many Muslims who are coming to the Lord, but they're going through a tough time uh, because uh, they're not loved. They're not accepted. So please pray for them that they will continue in their faith because a, a lot of them tend to revert back to Islam. So please pray for them. Pray for us as we... Uh, take on this translation project. I'll be involved in translating Christian service courses into Urdu language and uploading them onto our website. There are 200 million Urdu speakers in the world today, mainly in Pakistan and in India, and then the diaspora community around the world. So please pray for us as we translate and upload these courses onto our website that many Urdu speakers will come to know the Lord through these courses. Also pray for us that the Lord will open doors for us in places like never before. You know, in places like Iran, China, people are afraid to go to churches. They're afraid to ask questions. But we can reach them in their own homes through Internet. So please pray for us. Um, thank you, thank you so much for all your prayers and support over the years. You guys have been so faithful to us. So I want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for your prayers and support. It is because of your prayers and support that we're able to do what the Lord has called us to do. And there will be people in heaven who will be thanking you for their salvation. So thank you so much for your continued prayers and support. Uh, we need that support because Global University doesn't support us. We have to raise 100% of our support. So please pray as we itinerate and go around churches that we will be able to raise our full support. I have a short message from Matthew 5, 43 through 48. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can um, open it. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you after that my story, how I came to know the Lord from a Muslim background. And along the way, I will share a little bit about Islam and, and what Muslims believe. Hopefully, some of the things I share will help you to reach out a Muslim. I don't know if there are Muslims in this uh, part of the uh, city or not, but there are a lot of Muslims in USA, and they're growing. If you go to Chicago, you'll see a lot of Muslims. So hopefully, uh, some of the things I say will help you reach a Muslim. And then I'll share with you a little bit about uh, the church attack, and then, and then I'll close. So uh, Matthew 5, 43 through 48, <clears throat> it says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Father, thank you for this moment that you've ordained for each and every one of us here today. Father, I just pray that you would speak to us. Father, open our ears that we will hear you, open our minds that we will understand you, and open our hearts, Lord, that we will respond to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Reminds me of, an, of a joke of a 98-year-old lady. Uh, there was this pastor who preached a message on forgiving your enemies. And so he preached the message for about 40 minutes, and, and, and then he gave an altar call. He said, how many of you are willing to forgive your enemy? So about half of the congregation raised their hand. But the pastor wasn't satisfied. So he preached for another 10 minutes, and then he gave an altar call again. How many of you are willing to forgive your enemies? This time, 80% raised their hand, but the pastor was still not satisfied. So he preached for another 10 minutes, and then he finally gave the altar call, and this time all the congregation raised their hand, except for one 98-year-old lady sitting at the back. And so the pastor was a little bit puzzled. So the pastor asked, why didn't you raise your hand? And the lady said, I don't have any enemies. And the pastor was impressed. So he called the lady up front, and asked her to share with the congregation how did she manage not to have any enemies. And, and the old lady said, Pastor, it's very simple. I just outlived all those buggers. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think we're not quite there yet, right? We all have one or two people that are challenging in our lives, right? So um, I'll share with you how I came to know the Lord from a Muslim background. And in Pakistan, Muslims and Christians, they're enemies to each other. And so I'll share with you how the love of a Christian family changed my life. So I grew up in a, a Muslim family, and so I was taught how to pray five times a day. I was taught um, how to read my Quran in Arabic. I was taught to fast during the month of Ramadan. You know, Muslims, they fast during the month of Ramadan. They don't eat or drink anything uh, from sunrise to sunset. And, and so in, 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 summer, uh, in summer, they have long days, so it gets challenging uh, not to eat or drink anything for the whole day. But you can eat at night as much as you like. So it is estimated that more food is consumed during the month of Ramadan than any other month of the year. I just love Ramadan in Pakistan. <clears throat> so I, I, I prayed five times a day. I read my Quran. I fasted, and I did everything to um, fulfill the requirements of the religion. I remember I used to cry out God's name every day, five times a day. God is great. God is great. But this God that I was crying out every day, I did not know this God. In Islam... You cannot know God. To have a personal relationship with God is totally unheard of. God is, is a holy God. He's a powerful God. He's a judging God. And so you just leave him alone, and you just concentrate on your good deeds. So if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, they believe that they have a chance. But they do not have the assurance of salvation. This is an important point to hold on to. When you're talking to a Muslim, none of them can say for certain that if they die, they'll go to heaven. You know, they will talk about their good morals and everything, but if you ask them, do you know for certain if, if you die today, you'll go to heaven? They say, no, we cannot say for certain. Whereas we Christians, those of us who have trusted our lives to Jesus, who have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we know for certain, right, that if we die today, we'll be in heaven. Amen? Amen? Not because of what we have done or what we can do or how good we are, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He's the way. He's the only way. There's no other way. And, and so 
Um, so I cried out God's name every day, five times a day, but I did not know this God. And so what happens when we don't know God? What happens when we don't have a personal relationship with God? There's something missing in us, isn't it? There's some, something void in us. It doesn't matter how many times we come to the church. It doesn't matter how many times we read our Bibles. It doesn't matter how much money we give. It doesn't matter what we do. If we don't have a personal, intimate relationship with God, then there'll be something missing in us. And that's what happened to me. I was going through my religious motions. I was doing my duties, but I was void and empty inside. Anyway, as I grew up, I, I went into drugs. I thought somehow drugs could fill that emptiness in me. But before I knew it, I was heavily addicted into drugs, all kinds of drugs. To cut the story short, I ended up in jail. Now, this is the jail in Pakistan I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the jails over here where you get to work out, watch television, and do all sorts of stuff, okay? This is a jail in Pakistan. It's like a dungeon. You don't want to go near it. And it was there in the jail at the lowest point of my life, I realized what kind of mess I was in. I, I guess I realized for the first time my need for a savior. And that is unique for a Muslim because Muslims believe that they don't have to be saved. They don't believe in original sin. They believe that Adam committed a very small mistake, God forgave him, and, and then life went on as usual. So when we are born, we are born sinless. That's exactly the opposite of truth, isn't it? Adam trusted Satan instead of God. And because of that, we were separated from God. And we need to be saved by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way. Amen? Amen. So I felt my need for a Savior, but I didn't know who this person would be. There was no one to tell me. Anyway, as I got out of jail, I got myself a job, and I was assigned a desk next to this beautiful Young lady, happens to be my wife today, praise the Lord. Uh, I didn't know she was a Christian. Her name is Nasim. it's an Arabic name, usually it's a Muslim name. But had I known that she was a Christian, I probably would have found some excuse to sit elsewhere. You know why? Because as a Muslim, I did not care for Christians. I did not like Christians. To be a Christian in Pakistan is the worst thing that can happen to you. Nobody wants to associate with you. You're like a sinner. You worship three gods. You worship a prophet as God. But as I look back now, I see God's plan of salvation for my life. I remember the first time my wife ever witnessed to me just by acknowledging the fact that she was Christian and she was not ashamed of it. And in that part of the world, Christians, they, they don't like to disclose their identity because of fear of rejection or persecution. And later on, I got to meet the whole family. Now, I was told that Christians are bad people. They corrupted the Bible. They get drunk. In fact, in Pakistan, Christians are the only ones who have official government permit to purchase alcohol. Somehow they've justified that. And, and when, they, when they make a movie in that part of the world, when they portray a Christian character, usually the guy has a large wooden cross hanging on his neck, and he has a whiskey bottle in his hand. And that's how you know he's a Christian. So that's the conception there. But when the Lord brought me to my wife and her family, I found them to be different. They were walking with the Lord. They were godly people. My father-in-law was a great man of God. And so I got curious, and I wanted to know a little bit more about Christianity. So I got hold of a Bible, and I began to read the Bible sincerely. Now, as a Muslim, I believed in the Bible, okay? Muslims are supposed to believe in all the previous scriptures. In fact, the Quran says if you, if you don't believe it, then you're not a Muslim. But Muslims are led to believe that what we have right now is not the original one. These are all corrupted by Jews and Christians. So 
the Bible we have today is not authentic. So if you give a Bible to a Muslim, maybe to oblige you, uh, he or she may take it from you, but chances are they're not going to read it. But I wanted to read it. And, and so it was at that point when I began to read the Word of God sincerely, something began to happen in me. I had never read anything like that before in my whole life. I had read Quran, even memorized portions of it, but that didn't do anything to me. But this Bible that I was reading was really touching me. It was changing me from inside out. Now, as a Muslim, I knew Jesus as a prophet. Muslims believe in Jesus as a great prophet. In fact, they believe in the virgin birth. They do not believe that he was crucified on the cross. They believe that God replaced him with someone else. I don't know why God would do anything like that. But anyway, that's what they believe. So they believe he's alive, and he's going to come again, and he's going to take care of Satan. But then it gets messed up. They, they believe that he's going to get married again, and he's going to have children, and then finally he's going to die. So it's all messed up. So I believe in Jesus as a prophet, but as I read the Gospel of John, I began to know him as more than a prophet. The Gospel of John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I read the stories about Jesus, the things he said, his love and his compassion for people, everything that I read about him began to touch me in a deeper way. And I finally became convinced that, yes, this is the word of God. And so I met a pastor who mentored me for some time. He invited me over to his church, and uh, he said, uh, you can bring your guitar along in the church, too. I said, wow, I can bring my guitar along. I love playing guitar. And, and so I really loved it. I couldn't do that in the mosque, right? They'll probably shoot me for that. But uh, I could take my guitar in the church, play along with the worship team, and everybody in the church were so loving. And then there was another pastor who took me to a convention that was going on in the capital city of Pakistan among the slum, among the poor Christians. Uh, the capital city of Pakistan is a, mo a modern city with good infrastructure, but within the city there are mud houses, there are slums where poor Christian people live. And that's where the convention was going on. And it was such a humbling experience for me that God decided to save me among the very people that I hated. God changed my hatred into love. I remember the altar call, and I remember quietly standing up and surrendering my life to Christ. And praise the Lord, since that day, all my drug addiction started to go away, and I was a completely changed person. And I praise the Lord for that. But you know what? It all happened because one Christian family, they were walking with the Lord. One Christian family, they shared their love with me. I was welcome in their house. As a Muslim, I was welcome in their house. Like I said, Muslims and Christians are enemies to each other in Pakistan. And they didn't argue with me about anything. They didn't say anything negative about my faith. They just simply shared their love with me. And their love changed my life forever. And there'll be many Muslim converts who'll tell you the same thing, that they came to know the Lord not because of an argument or debate, but because someone shared their love with them. I was in a convention in England, and uh, they had invited all the Muslim converts. And there was a panel of Muslim converts, and they asked them how they came to know the Lord. And every one of them said the same thing, that they came to know the Lord because someone shared their love with them a friend, a neighbor. And their love changed their life forever. And it's interesting that the two greatest commandments given by Jesus is about love, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the greatest commandments. All other commandments hang on these two commandments. 
love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. So there was this expert in the law, a Jewish expert in the law. He wanted to justify himself because according to the Hebrew tradition, a neighbor was a fellow Hebrew brother. So he was probably good to his fellow Hebrew brothers. So he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And, and in response, Jesus shared the parable of the Good Samaritans. You all are familiar with that? Jesus picked uh, three characters. He, he picked a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. So there's this man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and, and along the way he gets robbed, beaten, and left to die. A priest comes, looks at him, doesn't do a thing, walks away. Levite comes, looks at him, doesn't do a thing, walks away. But a Samaritan comes, stops, and helps this guy and saves his life. Do you know why Jesus picked a Samaritan to be the good neighbor? Because Jews hated the Samaritans. Samaritans were the despised people, and Jews hated them. And Jesus knew that the expert in the law hated the Samaritans. And so when Jesus turned the question back at the expert in the law and asked him, so who do you think was the neighbor? The expert in the law didn't even want to say the word Samaritan from his mouth because if he said the word Samaritan, he'll be unholy. That's how much he hated the Samaritans. So in essence, Jesus was telling him that it could be your enemy who's your neighbor. Love your enemy as yourself. Wow, that's challenging, isn't it? So who are the Samaritans in your life? Satan creates hatred and resentment in our hearts for our friends for our families. He creates hatred and resentment in our hearts for our colleagues. He creates hatred and resentment in our hearts even within the church. We live in a media-saturated society where every day we are bombarded with news, all kinds of news. And Satan uses those things to create hatred and resentment in our hearts because he knows that if he can manage to create hatred and resentment in our hearts, he's won the battle. Why? Because it is impossible to share the gospel with hatred and resentment in our hearts. What is the gospel? Is it a message of hate? No. It's a message of God's love, isn't it? God's unconditional love for the whole world. And with hatred and resentment in our hearts for others, we cannot share the gospel. We are called to make disciples of all nations, isn't it? That's the commission we have. That's the final commandment from Jesus. After his resurrection, he called his disciples to a specific place to give this final command it's like a military command before a battle. And he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And it's not just for missionaries and pastors only. How many of you knew that? It's for all of us who call ourselves Christians. You know, a lot of people think that we have to leave our home, our family, go to a distant country. No, you don't have to do that. Yes, Missionaries are called to go, but go is not even the main verb in the sentence. The main verb is make disciples. Go is like as you go, as you go about your life, as you go about your business, make disciples. And you cannot make disciples of people that you don't like, of people that are not nice to you, people that don't talk like us or look like us. It's impossible to do that. Satan tried to create hatred in our hearts when we were in Pakistan. We worked for Teen Challenge, and, and we were literally there to help them. We were inside a church when 
the suicide bomber came. He shouted, Allahu Akbar, die you infidels. And he started hurling grenades at the congregation. In a matter of moment, it was like hell broke loose. We thought we were dead. I remember I was bleeding to death. They had to take us to a hospital. I didn't know where my, when my, where my wife was. It was chaotic. There was hundreds of spectators outside the hospital. And I remember I was in the emergency room, and I was in excruciating pain. And I was thinking to myself, you know, we were there to help them. Literally picking up the drug addicts from the streets, bringing them to the center, feeding them, clothing them. We were there to help them. Why did they hurt us? And then we were just worshiping in the house of God. We, did, we were not hurting anyone. Why did they hurt us? Hatred began to creep in. But right there in the emergency room, I had a vision. And the, God showed me Jesus on the cross. And God reminded me of what Jesus went through. He went through the pain and agony that we cannot even imagine. He hung on the cross for hours with excruciating pain. Excruciating pain. And the prayer that came out of my mouth right there in the emergency room was the same prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. What did he pray? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So I hope, I hope that's your prayer today. I don't know your story, but God knows your story. God knows each and every one of you, what you've been through. God knows your hurt, your pain, your struggle. He knows it all. And today, he's asking you to surrender, to forgive, to forgive your oppressor and love them like God loves them. Amen? Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for letting me share my heart to you. And Pastor, are you here? Would you come and close the service? Thank you so much. God bless you.